Hello and welcome to uh, tonight's uh, talk with David Holmgren. Uh, we are at Sustainable Living Tasmania, which is personally one of my favourite non-government organisations in Tasmania. They do many fantastic projects about um, mobilising people to live, live abundant and good lives, which is fantastic. Um, tonight, just before we get started, um, my name is Hannah. I'm from Good Life Permaculture, as is Anton over here on the desk. And we work really hard to do things like these events just so we can uh, share fantastic people that we bring to Tasmania and just help build the critical mass of uh, mobilising people to do good things is the bottom line. Um, tonight, a few things you should know is that the toilets are behind you and the fire escape is behind the pumpkin soup, which I'll move. <laughs> And we won't need that anyway, but just so you're aware of those two things. Um, and if you have any particular questions, please come find me. I'll always be in this vicinity over here. Uh, we, you would have noticed on your way in that there were some books for sale that, um, by David, but also from the Greater Permaculture Network. And so after the talk this evening, you can find me out there if you'd like to uh, have any questions and potentially buy some books as well, which is good. Correct change is much appreciated, <laughs> which is good. And they're a lot cheaper than you'd buy at your local bookshop or anywhere else. Yeah, I think the whole suitcase of David's is books <laughs> and a few socks. <laughs> but yeah, let's get started. So we're very welcome, um, happy to welcome David Holmgren to Tasmania. We brought him down as part of our current permaculture design course, which is happening this weekend and coming weekends. Um, he is co-founder of Permaculture, uh, which was founded in Tasmania in the 70s. So it's a really beautiful thing to bring him back here to share his uh, his knowledge and skill, which is ever growing. Um, he is uh, David has a very rare depth of experience and insight into natural and social ecosystems. Um, if you ask him a question, you'll get a long answer, <laughs> and we will have question time at the end of this um, talk. And I really struggled in. Oh, sorry, my phone's going off. <laughs> this is a good memory to um, reminder to turn all our phones off. <laughs> I really struggled to inter um, to introduce him adequately because he ha is so deep. He's one of the most uh, the deepest pe persons I've ever met to have a conversation with. And so I'm just going to hand it over to him to say. Thank you for coming all the way to Hobart and um, welcome and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks Hannah and yeah it's great to be back in Hobart. I was here briefly last in 2006 on a tour with Richard Heinberg, the H squared tour which was the first time I'd done a round Australia tour which inevitably involves getting on planes and doing things that I don't like to do. And I've just been doing that again, this time with Nicole Foss. She wasn't able to be here in Hobart. She's headed back to New Zealand now. But I'm doing a presentation that has lineage back to the presentation I did in 2006 here in, in Hobart with Richard Heinberg, but evolved in many ways. It's about dealing uh, with the world we're facing in a creative, positive way, but through a bottom-up empowerment uh, rather than waiting for uh, appropriate uh, policies from the top. And I call this permaculture surfing the property bubble dumpers because since 2006, one of the few people who sort of really influenced me in the whole uh, peak oil, energy descent, uh, future scenarios debate has been Nicole Foss. And what she clarified for me was firstly the complexities of how economic contraction can happen and what are the differences between hyperinflationary uh, economic collapse and deflationary collapse. She further can Vince me in the debates that happened uh, through those years, starting back um, about 2004 in the run-up to the GFC, that we were heading for a deflationary collapse. And that, that economic factors were the leading indicators of those longer-term driving crises 
um, of uh, peak oil and climate change. So in this presentation, I'm mostly focusing on the, the positive side, but I have included a little bit of contextual understanding of nesting the economic issues within the larger uh, peak oil and climate change issues. I took this photo off the internet as you do these days, um, even though most of my presentation photos are my own, uh, just because Surfers Paradise is such an iconic place where all these dreams of continuous uh, fantasy wealth creation and the hyper-consumer lifestyle are condensed in Australia uh, almost like no other place. And of course, it is a famous surfing beach. And surfing is very relevant because it tells us about the risks, about the threat, but about the possibility of working with forces that are beyond our control. Of course, it's also at sea level um, in a sort of iconic disconnect from the future, the long-term future we're facing. I've used this slide for more than 10 years to contextualise the future that we're facing and the way energy has been the fundamental driver in the development of civilization from its beginnings with agriculture 10,000 years ago up through this historical mountain where we tap fossil fuels. Energy, resource use, population and pollution have pretty much gone in sync together. They are very closely uh, locked to one another. Of course, this has been not a smooth process, massive ups and downs. We could look at punctuations like the Black Death in Europe and various other things in Chinese civilization. But the general pattern is very clear. We've now arrived at a climax, a sort of postmodern cultural chaos, where we're uncertain about that future and its possibilities. So if we think of that future in terms of the great-grandchildren, or the time it takes for an old growth forest to mature. This is really quite a short timeline compared with the historical timeline, but unimaginably long for modern people to contemplate. Now, maybe we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves because throughout history, ordinary people are very much concerned with day-to-day -day events, um, even right down to where the next meal is coming from, and maybe think about their children a bit, and maybe their grandchildren as they get old. But throughout human history, going right back in indigenous cultures, tradition, religion, and other forms of deep embedded culture have given us the capacity to think ahead. In more modern societies, that has been embedded in institutions. The irony now is that our institutions have a time horizon which is less than some individual humans are capable of thinking about and actively responding to. That's a sign our civilization is actually in a serious decay phase. So if we try and think about that, that future, you know, if you want to put years on this, maybe 250 years or uh, whatever, it really falls into four possible futures. The first I call techno explosion. This is the future that I was promised in kids' magazines that I occasionally read in the 1950s and 60s, um, you know, that I'd have holidays to Mars, and I haven't actually been to Mars yet, and I don't really want to go. But more seriously, uh, in 1950, the chief advisor to the Australian <coughs> government on nuclear power, Sir Ernest Kitterton, asserted that nuclear power would be so cheap it would be free um, by 1980. Didn't happen. Many of the other markers of that techno explosion future have not come about. The only exception to that is really the information technology revolution. And another way of understanding that is really that's just the icing on the cake of the fossil fuel era. 
more embedded fossil fuel to just keep doing a little bit more with that massive wealth, wealth surge we gained out of fossil fuel. So if that future is highly unlikely, the next one that um, is in the bargaining process with reality, I call techno stability. This is the idea that we will make this seamless transition from unsustainable use of non-renewable resources to innovative and new technologies tapping renewable resources that won't require us to simplify society like existed before fossil fuel that we'll be able to maintain most of the structures and benefits of complexity in dense cities, in complex governance structures, in complex technologies and fairly affluent ways of life. But that we will also reform our economic systems so they no longer depend on perpetual growth, at least in consumption of materials and energy. And at the same time that we'll deal with the backlog of massive global inequity which has accelerated in recent times and the psychosocial debt of generations of overconsumption and do it very, very fast. To me that future has seemed a reasonably remote one and increasingly uh, less likely than even the first. The future that I've seen that in some form is most likely I call energy descent. To use that word because it is the most honest word in English to describe a continuous contraction in the available energy and resources to support humanity for long into the future. Of course, there's a fourth scenario which people tend to default to when even considering the possibility that either of these first two will not eventuate. <laughs> Collapse, And by collapse, I don't mean collapse of the financial system or collapse of the suburban way of life. I mean, as many climate scientists are now talking about, the, virtually the collapse of planetary systems and certainly the complete uh, collapse of civilization. Seems very strange to me that this shift is made without considering the complexities and li systemic likelihoods of energy descent because some of our best documented examples of past civilizational overshoot are not really collapse in that extreme sense, but descent. That's why it was called the decline of the Roman Empire. We have phenomenal documentation of uh, descent pathways. But of course, this all depends on what your perspective is. For many people, um, the collapse of the financial system and uh, current affluent ways of life will be the end of the world. But obviously, in a broad sense, it won't. Permaculture has always been this creative, designed response to the energy descent future. Of course, it has existed on the fringes of our society in a world that has struggled to move from this absolute confidence in this techno-explosion future to this bargaining with the devil about the techno-stability future. But in the energy descent future, permaculture, not necessarily in name, but in underlying principle, uh, becomes normal. The positive out of energy descent is that it's a change culture. And the one thing that we can carry over from our previous culture of change, of growth, of massive continuous growth, is that every generation had to do something different from the previous generation. And that's what our descendants will have to do too. So that requires creative design, constant flexibility, dealing with novel situations rather than some certainty for long into the future before we arrive at some steady state. I use this diagram to sort of illustrate what an economy looked like uh, before fossil fuel. The economy of nature dominated the world the renewable of soil fertility, pu self-purification of waters. Just throw rubbish in the river, the river will purify it all. Um, the natural recycling of, of things. And the human economy was mostly in, was non-monetary, in the household. Self-reliance, 
in the community as gift, barter and informal exchange. The monetary economy concentrated in market towns and small cities was really the icing on the cake, providing for special services and functions. And then the little lubricant of that was the, the proto type of the financial economy, the money lenders and the first banking systems. In the fossil energy economy, it looks something like this, where the bottom two layers are squeezed and resources are sucked up into the monetary economy. In our own lineage, Dick Whittington going to London because the streets were paved with gold. That's that shift out of the household and community economies of the countryside into the monetary economies of the city. And of course, it was not just the attraction of uh, the moth drawn to the light of the golden city, it was the stick of the enclosure laws that enclosed the commons, the community uh, economy that was not monetary. That process is still going on in the world today and our wealth actually depends on it happening in China at a rate a few years ago of 12 and a half million people a year moving from the more community economies of the countryside into the city. That's what our wealth that we've been digging out of the ground has been building in China. Nicole Foss had the figure that in the last two years, China has used more cement than the United States used in the 20th century. Um, that didn't come from selling stuff to us. It mostly came from building for this imagined continued move from the country to the city. But last year, that flow of people has halved. When that reverses, um, start to think what happens. So the other aspect of this economy that we have is that a special form of human organisation called a non-natural person under the law, the corporation has an increasingly large slice of the monetary economy and especially the financial economy. But that's not where we are today. This is my diagram of where we are today. Because the material economy that this money lubricates and runs of actual material assets is tiny compared with this unreal economy of finance, which is, of course, virtual. It's not anything. And we don't call it a bubble for nothing. It's the scale of this is estimated to be between 100 times the material economy and a thousand times. And as Nicole Foss points out, that can disappear overnight, leaving the economy without its operating system and without, in the mechanical analogy, the lubricant of the engine of the economy. <coughs> of course, most of that is dominated by the corporate chair. Even if some of the money, the wealth that underpins that is supposedly the wealth of the global middle class of a billion people, which is underpinning that. The trouble is, this is really being created not by printing money, because printing money divides the real wealth cake up into smaller and smaller fractions. That's hyperinflation. What we did is a massive credit expansion which creates multiple claims to the same real assets. So Nicole's al analogy is we are in a giant game of musical chairs and there's about 100 people for each chair. And when the music stops, those who are best placed to understand the rules of the game grab a chair and everyone else is less um, holding the empty bag of worthless assets. So what are these? Where is this debt growth? We constantly hear about government debt. This is from Steve Keen's website. He's one of the economists in the world who directly predicted the GFC. He's almost ignored in the Australian media. He's one of the world's most well-known economists. His school at the University of Western Sydney was closed down. That was the way they got rid of him. 
I think he works in France these days. Um, anyway, uh, you can see the government debt, its decline from 88 to 2004, and then the uptick after they threw money at everything after the GFC. That's what most of the debate is about. You'd think there'd be more debate about that rising line of personal debt, the black line there. Uh, but then when you look at the business debt, that massive jump, this is as percentage of GDP. And then, of course, the elephant in the room is mortgage debt. From something like 12% of GDP back in 76 up to almost you know, 90%. We're very going down very, very little after the GFC. So that's as a percentage of GDP. Well, how big was GDP in 1976? It was 100 billion US dollars. It's now 1,500 billion US dollars. So if you think of multiplying that, it's the absolute scale of the debt is 15 times greater than, than those figures than what it was. So that is all this fabricated wealth. How does that translate into real estate bubble comparisons? Do people remember when a block of land in Tokyo was worth you know, more than a whole city in Australia? Uh, that was uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. That's the black line there. And see how the values have fallen on a long slide. Some Japanese whoopers were telling me the other month at our place that they were looking at a five-acre property at the end of a bitumen road with power, um, internet, telephone, postal service, 200-year-old farmhouse in good condition, five acres of rice paddies and all well set up, $25,000. Uh, so, you know, real estate values just don't go up. And there's the US, uh, the blue line, with its ticking along until uh, about the turn of the millennium, and then this massive bubble which was created directly by government policy. That's the way you have fake economic growth when you can't have real economic growth. And then that huge drop, which is in a lot of places left houses at sort of half their value. Um, and you can see the restabilization by the government throwing ridiculous amounts of credit at the system. And the Australian one, with that flat and then another plateau after the first homeowners uh, policies were brought in. And then as those policies keep increasing and cranking it up, you can see that ridiculous height we've reached. One of the biggest property bubbles anywhere in the world. So how does this fit into a context of energy descent? Because energy is the more underlying basis of all biological systems and human systems, whereas money is just an abstraction to allow us to more effectively use energy. And energy descent is the decline in net energy available to support humanity after all the direct and indirect costs have been subtracted. We can expect it to mirror energy ascent very fast over several decades and then more slowly over several centuries. The sting in the tail is that the rate of change appears much greater because of this radical change in direction, basically permanent economic contraction with occasional sort of growth spurts, rather than continuous growth with occasional recessions and depressions. Of course, we like to think of it as a gentle decline like a balloon coming back to Earth as the most hopeful future, and the way that this will save us from the climate cooker, because nothing else seems like it's going to. I love this little uh, graphic road sign designed by permaculture colleague Patrick Jones, indicating the urgency and the risks of this process, but the possibilities that can be navigated. So in 2008, I published this book um, at the behest of uh, permaculture colleague Adam Grubb, who was thought it was very important that this work uh, got out. 
and it's my future scenarios work looking at four different possible emergent scenarios for energy descent. Green tech, brown tech, earth steward and lifeboat. They are all energy descent scenarios but in very, very different, driven by the uncertainties around energy decline and climate change. I thought about including a matrix of uh, the ways in which the economy might uh, uh, break down but I didn't believe that they were fundamental drivers and I'm glad I didn't because I now think I understand more about how that works from these four. And my most recent essay has really called it for the, that we are already in the brown tech scenario. So, of course, permaculture focuses on the opportunities from energy descent. And although that can unfold in many different ways, it almost certainly uh, initially leads to higher prices for natural resources. Or whether it's higher prices in absolute terms, in a deflationary economy it may be lower prices but less affordable ones. So that's the important point, that they're really less affordable. And that will drive energy conservation and renewable energy development. It will also boost agriculture and rural economies and allow low input and organic farming to compete against intensive land uses because they use less of those energy intensive inputs like fertilisers and herbicides, etc. Contracting economies free buildings, equipment, land for use at low cost. Lots of opportunities emerging there. And it rewards those with savings rather than those with debt. Now the reduced mobility of people and goods that comes as a result makes local products more competitive than imported ones. It stimulates repair, self-reliance, retrofitting and recycling. Not because these are seen as environmentally progressive, but because they're just more economic. And it'll increase community interaction and exchange. Now, not all of this will be positive, but at least people will be talking to their neighbours again, even if only because they can't get away from them. And it'll restart our household uh, and local economies, this process we call relocalisation. We know this will happen because at every previous economic contraction in history, this is what happens. As the monetary economy falls apart and maybe falls to a very small proportion of what it was, people don't necessarily starve and disappear. They restart and rebuild those informal economies. Of course, we have a little bit of catching up to do in that regard because we have the most depauperate, uh, weak, uh, household and community economies in history because we've been on the, the affluence trail for so long. So this relocalisation shifts power and respect to older and rural people with self-reliant skills. Probably a lot of people in this room who might feel a little comfort from that. Um, and for younger people, well, people who can work physically will be uh, much in demand. Um, it will also favour those who are applying permaculture principles, whether they are doing that consciously or unconsciously, because these permaculture principles are inherently designed and adapted uh, for that world. So maybe me rubbing my hands with glee about the energy descent future is a bit like the oil companies saying, oh look, the future is very bright, um, we're going to have lots of big projects extracting oil out of crappy resources with heaps of engineers and massive investment and we'll have these great empires, you just will get very little real wealth out of it at the end. Because that's of course the message we're getting from the energy industry, that the future is bright. And the economists are so clueless, they can't see the difference between an economy which is growing by just harvesting more energy and using it back into harvesting more energy than any other sort of growth in the economy. So they don't even recognise that difference. So um, maybe in that sense, focusing on these things coming about uh, better late than never, um, we see a lot of uh, positives. So 
just sort of thinking about that in a sort of a big context, what will we do with all our coastal real estate that won't actually really be worth anything? And really long before nature turns this development into sort of new reefs and fish hatcheries, um, there's going to be an intervening period where we have to sort of think about um, treating it as stranded assets, if not um, lost uh, waste. Will we build more seawalls, emulating the Japanese, pouring concrete into protecting our uh, coastal real estate? Um, or will we think more creatively about that? Some of the ways to think creatively about that really require a big picture, long-term view. Not so much in Tasmania, but everywhere I go in coastal Australia, these Norfolk Island pines stand as sentinels along the coastline, immune to the salt wind, immune to the cyclones virtually. They are the only tree, large tree that Fremantle City Council in Western Australia, where I grew up, continue to plant in the urban area in the sort of uh, frontal zone of the coast because they are so strong. These are the landscapes, especially down the east, where extended cyclones surges, um, high tide surges, will uh, damage these landscapes. This is fantastic timber for future generations. And it's ironic because there is no tree that you can grow on coastal sand environments that will produce timber, except this tree. So I sort of think of these landscapes as being inherited by this great barrier of Norfolk Island pines down the east coast and the west and south coast of Australia. But of course, there's a lot more immediate concerns. What will we eat and what will it cost? Will we all have ration tickets to Coles that's kept stocked by corporate logistics, backed by taxpayers' subsidies, like some sort of Soviet-era supermarket? Or are we going to create the parallel food economy of farmers' markets, CSAs, backyard gardens, exchange systems outside of that regulatory framework, inside the household and community economies, and grow a new monetary food economy from the bottom? It's interesting that that's not so different, really, from how Russians were kept well-fed uh, via their dacha gardens in the Soviet era and certainly when the Soviet Union collapsed. So, of course, there's a million opportunities in Australia because we have this fantastic climate of year-round food production, even in Hobart. Uh, and all of this available space, because our cities are actually spread out, so much so that there actually is enough space, if in a completely transformed economy, for us to provide all the food for people who live in at least our suburban landscapes from those landscapes. Not that that's necessarily an immediate sort of aim or objective or even in the long term would be a totally sensible thing to do, but it's actually technically possible. So what will we do with all our unused spaces, all our unused buildings that we're currently trashing and replacing in mad building booms? I love this photo by Adam Grubb, sheep grazing in a petrol station. So the real focus of this work is really about the suburban landscapes where permaculture activism really started in Melbourne in the late 70s and in other cities. It didn't start so much in the, uh, the back to the land um, push. That was a parallel thing which was happening, but the real popularisation of permaculture was in the suburbs. So per can permaculture renew the suburbs after the property bubble collapse? And by the suburbs, I don't just mean the spaces around our capital cities. I mean the suburban template of separate houses in our 
um, small regional towns and even small villages, which in many ways are the landscapes that are still left in this way because in our large cities the infill development has overridden a lot of that suburban pattern. So the suburban opportunities are huge for home-based work, telecommuting, cottage industries, uh, extended families, lodges, shared households, getting bigger households in the same buildings. We have so much surplus space. How much surplus? How many surplus beds? I did some derivative figure from ABS statistics in Australia's eight and a half million households. There's about eight million spare beds. And that's not counting all the stuff in the motels, um, all the warehouses in gymnasia and stuff that we could retrofit to housing if we needed. We've got more buildings in this country than we need for a long, long time. Even though the Housing Association lies to us every year about the demand for housing. You know they include all the homeless people as part of the demand figure? Isn't that a sort of a maybe possible wish rather than actually a capacity to, to buy? The fertile soils, water supply and infrastructure for urban water and human waste. And city farms, CSAs, farmers markets, perma blitz, transition. Scale, but has the potential to be and spread. Read the landscape and the resources, sidestep the obstacles, grasp the opportunities, turn the problem into the solution. Now when I was here last, I did this through Aussie Street. And I've revamped Aussie Street in the last years to take us a bit further into the 2020 Second Great Depression. But I want to start back in the 50s, especially for people who haven't seen this presentation. But it's also um, a lot of fun. And it's part of our real social history. And part of that story about how growing up in the suburbs, at an early age, I saw it, like many other commentators later saw it, as the most extravagant, wasteful, anti-ecological way of living that had ever been designed. But by the 1990s, I was teaching on permaculture design courses that the suburbs of the 1950s and 60s might be a model of sustainability we could aspire to because everything had gone so far in the wrong direction. So let's have a look at Aussie Street. It's um, quarter acre blocks, uh, 1,000 square metres with 140 square metre brick and tile war service homes, all pretty much the same with a porch out the front and a veranda out the back. Fred and Hilda are a married couple with no kids. They live in number one with their uh, unmarried sister, Ethel. And they've got all the usual things, the hill's hoist, the shed, uh, the garage, the car down the gravel driveway, the chooks out the back, the veggie garden, fruit trees, and the irrigated lawn, and the ornamental garden out the front. This could be sort of anywhere, but for reference on the technical side, it's probably in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. Some of the technical details might be tuned slightly differently for Hobart or for other cities. Okay, over in number two, Harold and Marge live there. They're a married couple with three kids. They've got uh, most of the same sorts of things. Um, uh, they don't have any chooks. They've got fruit trees. And they're not so keen on watering the lawn. <coughs> Number three, Sid and Sue live there. They've got five kids and a dog. And Sid is a mechanic who works out of the backyard uh, from his garage. They've got two cars, which is not surprising. And they've got the hills hoist. They're not really into gardening at all much. Uh, but they've kind of this gum tree in the backyard. 
for some reason. I don't know. La vita è bella. Uh, so Murray and, and Angela live at number four. They've got three kids. Um, we're not really quite sure where they're from, Malta or somewhere, I think. Uh, but anyway, they don't have a car, but they've got the largest veggie garden in the street. Fruit trees, and they've got a goat that's tethered in the backyard. Um, out the front, they've got, instead of an ornamental garden, they've got an olive grove. Okay, so this is the golden age of suburban growth when we were the richest country in the world running on the sheep's back. Well, the applause is because the people count in Aussie Street is 20. This is actually denser than modern suburban development. Um, and the floor area is only 560 square metres. Now, planners have been telling us for at least 50 years that we have to make our cities more efficient uh, by having people living at higher density for the efficiency of the sewerage system, the transport system, and that in recent decades that's been seen as the, the gold standard for environmentally sustainable cities. And the way to do that without any question is to put up more buildings. So we'll see how that actually has worked out in Aussie Street. But as a measure of the robustness of the household economy, the average time away from home is about 17%. Now, believe it or not, I actually did a spreadsheet for everyone in Aussie Street and sort of worked out what they do and uh, based on my lived <coughs> experience of these times and worked out, yeah, how much time people are spending there. And then something that no one had ever heard of back then, greenhouse gas emissions, they're probably about 30% of 2013 averages. And the biggest reason for that is that people just had less money and were consuming less. Um, the other reason is there was so much production going on in the household economies, which is way more efficient um, in terms of energy and resource use and therefore greenhouse gas emissions. You know, when you grow vegetables at home and it doesn't have to be trucked and transported and then you drive to the supermarket. It's way more efficient in terms of those factors. Of course the houses were all uninsulated and um, electricity was cheap, but uh, people remember growing up when they only had one electric light and they told their kids to turn off the lights. Um, so yeah, it was a different world. <laughs> We move on to the 60s and 70s, which is the era of rising affluence and additions. Fred encloses the back veranda to get more space at number one. And at number two, uh, Harold gets a new car to drive to uh, commute to work. And at number three, uh, they get a new car and they enclose the veranda. Of course, remember they're bursting out of the seams there with five, five kids in the 140 square metre house. Now over at number four, uh, Mario gets a car finally and uh, oh, the other thing that happens, the water authority uh, puts the sewer main through the back. So people don't have to worry about the septic tanks anymore, you can pour anything you like down the, uh, down the toilet and it all just goes away. Um, and the council has put curb and channeling in on the Richmond Street and planted native trees, uh, which is now called the nature strip. Okay, so, um, oh wait a minute, what's happened? Uh, Sid split with the floozy. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, that leaves Sue and the five kids um, struggling with the mortgage and her part-time uh, cleaning job at the high school doesn't sort of really match and uh, she leaves, moves in with the parents, I think somewhere else. And Greg and Ruth are the new owners. They move in with three kids. And um, they really like the gum tree in the backyard. They were mad keen native plant enthusiasts and they planted the whole of the backyard to uh, <coughs> trees and shrubs and the front yard in this native garden. And they pulled down the old uh, grease covered workshop <laughs> and put up a double garage games room and concreted the driveway. Um, okay. Uh, I really 
got rid of the hill's hoist. Well, actually, the gum tree was dropping all the leaves on the on the washing. Anyway, they got a clothes dry, so they didn't need it. And um, over at number four, well, Mario and Angela are working double shifts in the um, in the factory, and they've sort of really given up on the the garden. Their kids are, are sort of uh, pretty slack and don't do anything around the place. And but they have built this great new addition um, out the back. And um, well, the olive groves contracted to one olive tree. I was thinking, what's the logic of that? You know, olives are really tough. What could have happened to the olive trees? Oh, that's right. They tethered the goat out the front while they were at work and it remarked um, the trees. <laughs> and they had this uh, dispute with the neighbours on the north side. So they planted this whopping great cypress hedge so they couldn't see them. It blocked out all the sun, but anyway. Now, Hilda's still making sauerkraut out of Fred's cabbages. So there's still stuff going on in Aussie Street of a sort of productive nature, but it's mostly the older sorts who are doing it. And the people count is down to 17. The floor area is up to 660 square metres. The average time away from home has moved up to 25%, and greenhouse gas emissions are 60% of 2013 averages. So as Aussie Street moves on into the 80s and 90s, it's ageing and infill. Fred and Hilda, uh, uh, an elderly couple. What happened to Ethel? Oh, she was actually a nun, and she was at, at doing missionary work in, in New Guinea or something. So she's no longer there. And uh, yes, they've given up. Fred's given up on the on the backyard food production. It's just unirrigated mown grass uh, now. Over in number two, Harold and Marge are moving to a nursing home. They're not particularly well, and neither is the gum tree out on the street verge. Well, it dies, actually. And uh, at number three, Greg and Ruth are now empty nest baby boomers, and they're retiring to Queensland. The native garden is now gigantic, um, overshadowing the place. And over at number four, there's a new developer owner who's moved in. Uh, Mario and Angela have um, built a palatial mansion out in the outer suburbs um, and uh, hoping to sort of um, plant the new olive grove. Uh, but anyway, the new developer sort of trashes uh, the, all the garden and builds a 180 square metre brick veneer in the backyard as encouraged by the planning laws to get that infill development to make our cities more uh, efficient in terms of infrastructure use. Now, of course, they concrete most of the backyard. And with all the extra runoff, uh, the council uh, you know, requires them to put in this stormwater detention system so the street stormwater system isn't overloaded. So there's this whopping great galvanized tank in under the driveway that just then leaks the water out slowly. Don't know what it's good for, but anyway, it's there. And a drip irrigated ornamental garden um, out the front. So Vivian moves into the uh, the front house. She's a separated working mother with two teenage kids. So no one's actually seen the teenagers. They're sort of couch potatoes that only appear in the dark. And Nigel and Rebecca are a young working couple with no kids, uh, but they've got two dogs. So, um, where are we up to? Well, the grand success of this planning strategy and policies is the people count in Aussie Street is down to 11. That means there's less people um, communicating to each other. It's getting really boring in Aussie Street. There's now 840 square metres of building space. So, in theory, it's worth a lot at the bank because um, uh, the real estate values have gone up. The average time away from home has gone up to 30%. And most of that is in the monetary economy, um, so-called producing and consuming, you know, at the gym, at the restaurant, uh, etc., at the childcare centre. 
and greenhouse gas emissions are 80% of 2013 levels. So what if energy, available energy is in decline? A falling energy base shrinks the economy, resulting in financial crises slash budgets. Brings problems back home, the fear politics, the refugees, extremism. Collapsing house prices and mortgage defaults. Current urban development strategies completely fail, including all of the environmental sustainability strategies in, in cities. On the other hand, the positives of energy descent is that it drives creative adaption and innovation, helps overcome obsessions and addictions, renews community spirit and solidarity, and rebuilds the informal economy. So what does that look like just conceptually? These three sectors, the corporate world, the business world, and our institutions are what employ the vast majority of people. And all of us are pretty much in that world, but then we're all engaged to some minor degree in the household and community economies. I think it was in the 70s that feminist economist Marilyn Waring from New Zealand <coughs> showed that if the unpaid work of women in the home was paid for, it would send affluent countries like Australia and New Zealand bankrupt overnight. So it, our non-monetary economies are still significant, but small. In energy descent, it ends up looking something like this, where there's this massive growth in those household and community economies that partly compensate for this collapse in the monetary uh, economies. So there's people who have thought about this and want to do something about it. Not in the sense of some grand design to change society, but more how are we going to adapt to that world? How are we going to live better uh, with this different reality? So let's go back to Aussie Street for the late 2000 permaculture retrofit. So Fred and Hilda still hanging on in number one. Um, Oliver and Alicia are a young couple who, with savings, uh, bought number two, which, remember, is the only unrenovated house in Aussie Street. Crumbling front veranda and porch out the back, pretty crappy. Still with the old fruit trees down the back. Really, all the garden has sort of died in the in the drought. Looked really crap, but they just had enough money to buy this without debt. Oliver's a mad keen young permie, and he sets up his nursery in uh, the garage in the, the carport, and he's selling his plant stock out from the driveway. So that's his retail stock is all there. Now he doesn't have a permit from the council for this business operation, but it doesn't seem to be a problem. Uh, to anyone. And they start doing all the usual uh, permaculture things with their uh, limited funds. Now he hasn't got some icky little mandala veggie garden. He's actually got this serious chook tractor uh, row production system um, and he's supplying six boxes to customers who, um, few customers that come to his nursery. And as they get more money, they put in the water tanks and uh, greenhouse and shade house. And the greenhouse is cranking out seedlings in spring that are properly hardened off and uh, of all different heirloom varieties. And um, yeah, they filled in the chook run at the back with a whole lot of subtropicals uh, to create a sort of food forest. And out the front, there's um, herbs and perennials and berries. And they've planted uh, fruit and nut trees on the street verge. Now, he's done this little diversion of water by pouring a little bit of concrete in the gutter that diverts the storm water off onto the trees. Uh, didn't put in plans for the council for that either, but it doesn't seem to have caused a problem. And, um, okay, so the story gets a little bit complicated here because Oliver's got the a friend, Gareth, who's just come back from years overseas, and you know the place next door is empty. And I said, gee, it would be great to get that. Well, Gareth teams up with his parents, who he gets on with uh, really well, Ian and Andrea. They're a baby boom 
uh, couple and they've got a fair bit of capital from having sort of bought and sold a few houses over the years. Um, and they're into uh, yeah, all the things that um, Gareth and Oliver and Alicia are into, so they buy number three. Now, um, Gareth is really not into the growing side of things. He's actually a tech head, and he was attracted by the big games room workshop out the back, which he sets up as his metal workshop, you know, with his tick welder and brazing gear and um, into all sorts of projects. And they're one of the first in the uh, in the area to put a PV grid feedback system on the roof. The big change that happens when they take down the fence. Now remember, there's this long concreted driveway which actually then allows access to the whole backyard so Oliver can sort of really get cranking with bringing in compost materials, etc. Remember, he's got no access to on the other side because he's got nursery. They just have um, bicycles. They don't own a car. Um, so, wait a minute, what's going on? Uh, well, well, they logged the backyard. <coughs> well, the gum trees were all completely shading everything, and Oliver told them they won't be able to grow any food there. But anyway, they wanted to build this passive solar uh, eco addition. Um, so they've now got this massive pile of firewood, and they planted some more appropriate native shrubs up, up the back and uh, built this 12 square uh, eco addition passive solar uh, design. And they decide to do things more radically when they build this big concrete water tank that actually takes the water off both house roofs and provides a degree of autonomy um, and this big grey water system that takes the, the waste water. So they've cut the sewer pipes um, again, without any permission. Uh, they're still paying the water rates and the sewer rates, but uh, you know they're thinking about how that could sort of um, be changed. So on the west side and the north side, they've got all these great pergolas, and Oliver you know, gives them plant stock appropriate to that and sort of prunes them up so properly because they wouldn't know, you know anything about how to do them and would have just left the grapes in the great bramble pile at the bottom. Um, so there's this sort of exchange going on between, because uh, Oliver needs the, any work and he can get because you know, they don't have much money. Now, with all the extra space, um, Ian and Andrea are feeling a bit guilty about their ecological footprint in spite of uh, their lovely eco addition. And uh, they decided to take in a border, Jody. Um, you know, they didn't really have anything much in the way of debt, uh, but they thought it was um, good social responsibility. Now, there was some idea in the street that Jody and Gareth might have been a number, but we don't really know uh, about that at this stage. So, um, where are we? What happens next? Oh, yeah, well, the porch was all falling down on the front of the old place, and they built this greenhouse to replace it and it really improved the solar performance of the old part of the house and put this veranda along the, uh, uh, the north side. They've got this fern garden in the back where you sort of enter it in and that draws cool air in through a cool cupboard so they don't use the fridge anywhere near as, uh, as much. And um, so, oh yeah, well the young folks got together and had a street party and built a bread oven, and well, they had to use all that firewood somehow because um, you know they didn't really need that much in the in the house. Uh, so that's sort of a bit of an activity hub now on the on the street. And they put in this little kitchen garden and um, bits of berries, but Oliver said it won't grow very well because there's that huge gum tree on the street. Now, anyway. Something happened to the gum tree. It died <laughs> for some reason, and they planted fruit trees. That actually, the same varieties of sort that had worked well next door. Um, and then there was, you know, like a whole row of nut trees down between the two places that got their leaves really early and still let the sun in. Uh, wait a minute. The hills hoisters made a comeback, uh, and there's even a patch of lawn. Well, Oliver's actually spewing because he had to give up part of his production system 
because the mum said the babies needed a space to crawl around on without actually being in the veggie garden, which <laughs> Oliver was a bit fussy about them commandeering all the strawberries and munching directly on the lettuce heads before he had you know, a chance to um, pick them. So, oh, wait a minute. So I've got this big compost system up the back, and it's also got this wheelie bin compost toilet. Um, and Oliver's keen on the idea that if he can get the residents to not use the flush toilet inside, he can actually get way more of the, the nutrients and sort of get that into the production system. So that's down there, and gradually, you know, um, uh, the others are starting to use the compost loo up the back more often. So, oh yeah, and they saw how well the greenhouse worked next door, um, so they put up an even bigger one so he could expand his uh, seed leaf production. And when the, uh, the subsidies on the photovoltaic systems um, uh, uh, came through, they put in one of those on the roof as well. Now, over at number one, Fred and Hilda are sort of pretty frail, but Alicia was actually helping them under a program where the council paid for people to look after elderly neighbours. But then the risk managers assessed the program and decided that um, you, know, you couldn't have unqualified people helping elderly people, so they cancelled the program. But she's still doing that, and Oliver provides them with veggies. But, you know, he's sort of having difficulty talking to Fred about the backyard, because he desperately needs more space. He's got, you know, like a whole lot of people wanting to buy his veggies. He needs the money, um, you know, because, you know, that it really is their income. And but Fred's still very particular about his section of mown dead grass up the back. So this is Aussie Street as it was. Great possibilities here at number one for this colonisation process. Number four, very difficult. Not just in its physical design, but its social makeup. Absentee owner that no one knows who they are. You can't get past the real estate person to even find out who they are. Um, the tenants, yeah, not really connected with what's going on, and um, yeah, sort of not really uh, part of things. So I used to say it'll take a much bigger socio-economic change to engage uh, with things at number four without really knowing how that might happen. So the people count in Aussie Street is up to 15. The floor area has increased quite a bit, 860 square metres, but the average time away from home is down to 23%. And greenhouse gas emissions are back, back down to 60%, mainly because of this home-based food production and time at home, which is much more significant than the, um, the photovoltaic panels on the roof or um, that sort of stuff. So, well, so actually the objective of getting more people has been achieved as a byproduct of that permaculture retrofit, which the planning policies that we've been following for the last four years haven't managed to achieve. So what if we're facing the second Great Depression with deflationary contraction and credit collapse, falling house prices and mortgage defaults, job insecurity and unemployment, contracting government services and benefits, rising crime, xenophobia and fear politics, expanding informal and cash economies, extended families and shared households. Is this going to be the end of suburbia or the renewal of suburbia? So before we go back to Aussie Street, let's look at the Second Great Depression in real time in Detroit. This is Google Street View, just a street in Detroit in 2009. And here it is in 2013. Mm -hmm. Notice the place on the right is burnt down. And isn't it amazing how nature comes back? Okay, so how is Aussie Street faring? Because we're 
in the Second Great Depression in 2020. Now, someone said, how old are Fred and Hilda? <laughs> <laughs> and I had to do a calculation. You know, they were a, 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 a young couple when, um, you know, Fred actually met Hilda at, um, at a refugee camp after the Second World War. He was a soldier over there and, um, you know, they were pretty young when they started there. Um, so they're still there. I think they're in their 90s now. And uh, what happens? Well, Oliver's sort of uh, about to get his hands on the, on the backyard. But the way this happens is Megan, who's a customer uh, of Oliver, <laughs> well, not yet. No, he, he does put the, cut the hole through the fence and Fred eventually agrees to letting him take over the backyard and he's got this massive expansion of his production system. Uh, it's now triple what it was before. And um, one of his new customers as a result of that is Megan and she works in the hospital system which is increasingly dysfunctional and she uh, just really can't stand it much longer. And she gets to know Fred and Hilda really well. And through that process, she actually moves in as an informal carer. <coughs> and as that relationship develops, she sort of understands their feelings about issues like euthanasia and whatever, and they um, talk to her about that. And she's actually got the, the necessary materials, being a nurse, for <laughs> dealing with that. So this is, yeah, pretty serious stuff. Um, but it sort of gives the both of, of them a, a lot of uh, sense of security. Now, Jody and Gareth weren't a number. This becomes evident when um, Nisha, uh, Gareth's uh, girlfriend who's pregnant, moves in after she loses her job. So uh, there's quite a crew um, of younger people in Aussie Street now. Uh, with all sorts of informal uh, relationships to um, the the real estate in terms of owners and renters and sharers and workers. Now, over at number four, there's been a mortgage foreclosure sale. Well, whoever the owner was, they couldn't keep up the payments as the interest rates went through the roof and their debt level, um, the bank just sold them up after the house prices. Uh, dropped 25%, they uh, ran out of equity. Now, uh, Vivian's still there. Fred and uh, Nigel and Rebecca are still up the back. They sort of don't have very good relations uh, with other people. Some years ago, their dogs attacked some of Oliver's chooks and killed them. And uh, anyway, so um, uh, they're not on very good speaking terms. There's a second mortgage foreclosure sale. Another owner has been unable to keep up the payments even though they thought the place was a bargain. Um, and then the electricity, the gas and the water get disconnected, uh, presumably because Vivian uh, couldn't sort of pay the bills. And she m moved out, I think she went back to live with her parents. And the front place is empty at this stage. And there's not really that many takers who can afford uh, the rent. And there's now all these fees for connecting, you know, reconnecting um, uh, to the place. Okay, so what happens next? Um, well, there's a fire and the place burns down. Uh, the fire brigade put out the fire, but it's just a sort of a shell. And then uh, the council does this demolition because it's sort of really, they've got this policy that, you know, it's a bad look and need to sort of clean up these places where they're falling down houses. So it's just a sort of a rubbly paddock with sort of weeds growing out of it uh, now. And um, Nigel and Rebecca move out. Now, it might have been their financial situation, but their dogs actually did do in some more chooks and shortly after that their dogs mysteriously died. Uh, so uh, they left. 
Um, the place is now empty at the back, and what do you know, the squatter's moving. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Ian and Andrea are sort of looking at this thinking, what the hell? They've got savings still in the banking system that they're sort of worried about, you know, like, are the banks going to collapse? And, you know, the value of this real estate is really um, collapsed enormously. Now, there's a third sale and no one bids um, for this and Ian and Andrea decide to buy the place with their remaining savings. So they now, they now become the landlord of the squatters. <laughs> and the squatters, um, Kit, Lance, Seb and Lisa, they're actually a bicycle repair collective. You know, they're not quite as bad as what thought, though they're pretty uppity about the idea that Ian and Andrea think they own the place. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, they come to sort of an accommodation and the motivation is really that they know that Gareth has got this fantastic workshop next door and that he could fix cracked bicycle frames and stuff and manufacture new components that they can't do um, with their bicycle businesses going really well. Um, so, they, you know, the bicycle repair workshop, you know, gets set up in the garage and Andrea and Ian decide to um, invest a bit of capital in retrofitting the place. So Gareth worked out that he could put a, an old um, salvage sump pump into the stormwater detention tank and recycle the stormwater, which all was directed to that, up into a, a new water tank. Because what's happened is the collapsing uh, rate base has led to the Water Authority quadrupling water rates uh, because the whole business case of actually running the water and sewerage authorities is getting really, uh, really shaky with the collapse of, of real estate values. So the water self-sufficiency uh, issue is, is more significant. Now they also decided to build this greenhouse right along the north side, right up to the property boundary. Uh, because you just had the blank wall of the bathrooms and the bedrooms of this brick veneer house and by enclosing that with this greenhouse it improved the energy efficiency. Now we're not really sure what the bicycle collective is growing in the greenhouse <laughs> but anyway that's it. And Jody has been for years getting um, uh, unpasteurised goat's milk from a supplier but she can't get that any anymore. And uh, she decides that they should get a goat and uh, so it's goat back at number four, like they used to be, uh, on the vacant rubbly patch, which is um, pretty good because the goat actually gets its feet kept reasonably trim by sort of jumping across all the rubble piles and eating all the weeds. And the remnants of the ornamental garden out front uh, is actually good. Well, I think it was a fetinia hedge. And it's just perfect browse for the goats. Uh, now, the security issue with um, animals is a bit of a problem, uh, but the electric fence and people just being eyes on the street, it doesn't seem to be uh, too bad. So, wait a minute. Well, it wasn't actually anyone in Aussie Street, it was the people the next street over who were scavenging firewood around the neighbourhood and they just cut down the gum trees. So anyway, Oliver planted some more trees and they put a little um, electric ring guard around the trees that people didn't even recognise what it was. And uh, that seemed to deter the, the vandals. Um, What's happened over at number one? Well, yeah, after, after um, Hilda died, uh, Fred passed away um, quite quickly and they have actually worked out, because they didn't have any kids or anything, that they would actually bequeath the place to Megan. And she set up an eco-traveller's house for um, mobile nomadic young people, sort of like a, um, a low-class version of Whoopi. Uh, and of course they are really there, you know, Megan and Oliver are sort of, um, you know, Megan's the organiser of the work crew to enable this to sort of really start cranking. Well, the first thing is they build the Aussie Street uh, greenhouse 
uh, template that's been well proven uh, to work, and they put and Oliver puts up a huge new poly tunnel so we can start growing out of season veggies because the out of season produce coming from Queensland now is incredibly expensive and unreliable in the supermarket. So he's trying to sort of grow more out of season uh, stuff rather than just seedlings, which he was doing before. And then they have this big um, working bee and uh, retrofit the garage with a sort of light earth structure around it, and it becomes the new cool store for um, for veggies because there's quite big uh, production happening there. New grape pergola uh, along the driveway, and um, what else is happening? Uh, yeah, what else did they do? Well, Megan's also into bees, and she's got a whole lot of beehives in the front garden. Now, there might have been problems with kids ripping the fruit off the fruit trees before it's ripe and you know, threats that someone would kill the goat for meat, but no one seems to trouble the bees <laughs> for the honey, so that's pretty good. And uh, okay, so the people count in Aussie Street is back up to 20. The floor area is down to 680 square metres. The average time away from home is down to 14%. There's a whole lot of economic activity going on. And it's a lot better place to be than a lot of other uh, places. Greenhouse gas emissions are down to 20% at 2013 levels, so no one is interested in that anymore. So I think we can see from this process that as much of a fantasy good story it is, it is based in reality. It is based in actual stuff that people could do independent of what governments do. It doesn't require this top-down, sensible uh, restructuring of what we have. We can't wait for that to happen. So these processes of getting, producing, and supporting local producers, involving kids and their friends, making contact with neighbours, bartering, reviewing needs and reducing consumption, sharing your place, take in a border, share your car, carpool and picking up hitchhikers. These are processes that build uh, all of the community connections that are absolutely essential. Creatively working around the regulatory impediments rather than accepting that you can't do something. Be prepared to apologise afterwards rather than ask for permission <laughs> up front. Get out of debt and work from home. Absolutely. Uh, essential, the, the debt issue, and retrofit for the future, not speculative gain, because it isn't coming. And network for inspiration and information. Join or start a local permaculture transition group or whatever else is happening um, in your area. So I want to leave you with these uh, references and resources. This article, Retrofitting the Suburbs for the Energy Descent Future, is a more slightly more serious article about this process, but referencing this meta-analysis of Aussie Street. Hopefully, I'll get to the book on retrofitting the suburbs that's been sitting as a film manuscript for uh, six years. The other thing I wanted to particularly point to, apart from Nicole Foss's work at the Automatic Earth uh, and a lot of the primers there, her co colleague. Ilagi writes a sort of a running commentary on the global financial system, which may be a bit heavy-handed for most people to stomach. But Nicole's primers are uh, brilliant. And Shani Graham in Western Australia, Take a Street and Build a Community, is Aussie Street in action on the ground. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much, David. And so, hands up here, who lives in a small town or an urban setting? Yeah. Um, hands up who's had a new idea or inspiration or seen something they think they could try when they go home. Yeah, that's pretty good. And we've got time for a few questions now. I'm going to start the ball rolling. But um, I'm curious, David, if you were to tell the audience one thing, 
about what they could do when they go home in this kind of context that could help the ball get rolling, what would it be? Uh, I suppose talk to a neighbour that you don't have much contact with or maybe don't have much, many shared values with and especially if that's one close to you and might be affected by something you do mm. because that community connection is firstly the insurance against the regulatory problems because basically the regulators rely on the everyone being the police force to to inform on each other. Um, of course, it's really important that we do things and think about how what we do will affect other people. But if we have a personal relationship with people and keep people on on the page about those things while being circumspect, then we build that connection that Nicole Foss really emphasises this essential aspect of community is far more important than any of the technical uh, responses and uh, even the financial ones. Fantastic. Are there any more questions that we'd like to cover before we finish this evening's session? So Dave, you, you mentioned one of the key things uh, that people could do would be to uh, get out of debt and I, I see that as a, a huge challenge for the generation coming through in terms of being indebted uh, to the banks through that sort of steep sort of mortgage mm. debt level. What, have you seen any or heard of any st sort of strategies for Yeah, for well that? there's lots of different strategies. Um, permaculture colleague um, Richard Telford and his partner Cooney uh, run a blog called Abdullah House. They bought a house in a country town in Victoria, Seymour, that's on uh, the highway and the train line. It's quite a big town, but it's not a very attractive place. They bought the smallest, crappiest house on a block, pulled that house apart and rebuilt it as a modest house and uh, are now out of debt less than eight years later. Um, so people downsizing their expectations, moving to places that aren't necessarily the ideal in some way, um, is is definitely uh, one of one of the pathways. So finding those sweet points where there's something like Oliver and Alicia did, the place no one quite wants. Okay, it's still, you know, you're still talking about prices that involve debt. The other strategy is this building a bigger household, really using uh, becoming a landlord taking in people to help pay off debt. The moving from the city to country towns out of the, the super inflated cities like Melbourne and Sydney is now very, very strong for cities like Newcastle, Ballarat, Bendigo, people reducing their debt and often getting a house not much sort of different from what they had and often getting more backyard space and sometimes a community that may not be so um, super cool but may actually still have a lot of the community uh, self-reliance that sort of country communities have. Um, the other big one that how people will cope in the future of course is back with the extended families, the intergenerational equity of younger people getting working out how to get on with their parents who have the equity or not necessarily parents, the great pattern I see is woofing, where woofing is this toe in the water of this informal asymmetric power relationship between owners and visitors. That how we work out what that relationship is is really important process. And both parties need each other. You know, a lot of the older baby boom people, not just in houses in the suburbs, all those of us who have gone out into the country and have got these properties that we own outright and you know we're getting older, we need young energy in. Those young people in this current economy are never going to be able to own that. Those two parties need to get together. 
So there are many, many strategies, but they all involve a really sort of bold shift from where where people are. Mm -hmm. And for young people to wait, um, for people to hold their fire with um, savings and keeping that as liquidity to be able to watch the bubble collapse and buy at the appropriate time. It's very hard to judge and of course Aussie Street had that lesson that there's the new owner goes and buys and then it still is unable to support the the payments and you know the you know the values go down. But generally my advice to young people is do not get into the you know the large debt cycle. But everyone's situation is different. You know, so you can't sort of give that as some sort of template advice. And you've got to look at where your social connections are, um, like where you have the network connections may be more important, especially for older people. You know, to be happy that you are going to be stuck where you are, because you will be stuck, or to be a renter allowing the landlord to take the risk. So renting has traditionally been seen as a mugs game because you, you know, you just don't gain anything. Whereas in these situations, uh, renting is actually maintaining your flexibility to be able to move away from bad things happening into um, new opportunities. Mm. Yeah, plenty of food for thought there, that's for sure. Any other final questions for this evening? Yeah, Dan, do you want to come up a bit closer so we can? Um, David, you made the analogy about the musical chairs there. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you see the chairs being that people are going to be trying to grab? Well, the chairs are real physical assets. For example, in Greece at the moment, the railways, the ports, the agricultural land, a few of the tourist islands, and the Parthenon. You know, that's what the you know the EU and uh, you know the IMF are saying. You have to sell those, um, basically, you know, to the, you know, uh, the foreign um, creditors. We can see things like agricultural land will not fall as much as other real estate because it has productive value. Um, factories that actually can make something, parts of the material economy that still have some value apart from the speculative value. Uh, so that they are the chairs, the real substantial assets. Uh, and the multiple claims come via the you know confusing nature of the financial system. So of course that's how the the mortgages in the United States were sliced and diced and spread out and proliferated. So multiple parties thought they all owned those physical assets. So there was multiple claimants on those physical assets, but those physical assets then weren't really worth, you know, what they thought they were. So that in a in a way, you know, a hundred houses only actually became worth um, fifty houses. So there's this collapsing pool of uh, physical assets, um, both from uh, collapses in what were thought were real bricks and mortar assets to something that, well, unheatable houses that are too expensive for people to commute to jobs that don't exist. So you get back to the sort of more substantial um, assets. Uh, in a material sense for the ordinary person, it might be very, very simple things that are actually essential. Um, for example, bicycle tyres and tubes might be in high demand as people get all their bicycles out of the shed. Oh, the tyres are perished. You know, go down to the bike shop and, oh, the supplies from China are sort of not just more expensive. Oh, there's no shipment because the letters of credit of some foreign corporation has failed and they, yes, they're on the wharf in Shanghai, but they don't arrive. You know, so quite simple, ordinary things become actual uh, things of real value. So there's a, a whole lot of complexity there. If we read the history of um, the Great Depression, 
um, in lots of different places. We can see a lot of the patterns, though the structure of it could be quite different and you know much more dramatic than it was then. The great opportunity we have is this all this surplus capacity, you know, the triple garages that you can take the three cars out, get rid of two of them, maybe keep one, put it on the street and open up the, the workshop. We didn't have that in Aussie Street. There's a million other things that could have been in Aussie Street, you know, if we made it a whole suburb. So there are an incredible number um, of opportunities, but the, this process by which you get this credit expansion and then the credit collapse. All that credit is related to some underlying pool of collateral of real value that is supporting that massive value. So what's happening at the moment, that deleveraging is those in the know are you know, buying farms, you know, the wealthy, getting into real stuff rather than playing around with the derivatives in the stock market, they're off-roading all that to the mums and dads investors who believe it's it's going to be worth something, which is historically the way bubble dynamics and psychology always play out. They always have. Um, I was just wondering about uh, how obviously communities being able to um, sort of take you know some sort of control or interest in, in those sorts of assets. Well. Yeah. Well, in Spain, there are neighbourhood communities who actually resist people being thrown out of their houses. You know, so there's the sort of resistance networks. And then on the other side, there's this massive uh, return to the countryside where Spaniards and Greeks who still have family land in some remote village are going back out and restarting the local, uh, you know, uh, grassroots economy there because they don't have any jobs in the city. Now those sort of opportunities for Australians are not necessarily there because we don't have that relationship to that. But you know, for young Spanish people who, you know, 60% unemployment for for young people in Spain at the moment, half those people have a university degree, you know, and they spend a lot of time partying, and their parents' generation did after Franco as well. So there's a big steep learning curve on you know what's coming, but that, those are some of the community adaptive uh, strategies. Uh, things like local currencies, uh, let systems, time banks uh, that spring up spontaneously when the, the monetary economy fails. Uh, Nicole's work has focused a lot on those um, alternatives to, to central currency. Uh, Again, they have no certainty that those will survive and governments often end up quashing those things, but even the experience of developing them can be uh, useful. Um, so yeah, there's many different aspects of the, the community process. The important thing is that you must start at the bottom rather than immediately going, how do we organise some macro strategy to sort of insulate everyone from this? You know, because you must start at the bottom. You've got to develop things at the household and the network scale, things like barter and exchange, and grow up into small monetary economies rather than saying, how do we redesign our financial system? You know, it, 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 there's no evidence in history that that works. Those large systems actually crash and break down and uh, may be rebuilt, informed by all the experience in the bottom-up processes. But if you try and do it from the top down, uh, you know, it's just all the, the stuff at that level, even very positive stuff that's talking about global, uh, you know, debt reform and everything is, is just not going to happen. <laughs> um, right, I'm going to step in there. I told yes. you you, can't, you won't get a short answer from David, <laughs> but you'll get a good big one. So I'm going to stop us there. I know there's a few more questions, uh, but we will be able to ha um, hang out and mingle for a bit longer. But I'd just like to officially close tonight and say a big thank you to David for coming. We love having you in Tasmania, and we hope you come back again soon. So thank you for your time this evening. Yeah.